What's up guys, this is the Monday Night Rewind Podcast, where I go back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars to look at episodes from Monday Night Raw and Monday Nitro. So we're going back 20 years, as I said, so we're going to September 15th, 1997 this week. And so we're going to start off with Raw and then go with Nitro as we usually do. Um, so first off with Raw, this was number 225 and it took place in Muncie, Indiana. Which is kind of cool because I'm from Indiana, so it's here in my home state. Uh, but the, first off, we kicked off with a match, which doesn't usually occur in Raw very often, let alone also back in the mon uh, Monday Night Wars or Attitude Era and stuff. But we kicked off the show with a Ken Shamrock versus Farouk match, and this is for continuing on the Intercontinental Championship tournament that they're doing that I believe started the last week or the week before. I can't remember exactly when for sure. But like I said, it's Shamrock versus Farouk. To start off, Farouk uh, starts off the match super hot. I believe he's angry at Shamrock for a past loss or something most recently. Like I said, I can't at this moment remember exactly what's went on with like pay-per-views and everything. But for some reason, he has a some reason that he's mad at Shamrock and stuff. So he comes in and just immediately starts the match. And throughout the match, uh, Shamrock keeps throwing a lot of like kicks to Farouk's legs. So again, trying to get the legs taken out of the big strong man of Farouk. And Farouk does a uh, spine buster on the Shamrock. And as soon as he starts doing it, Shamrock starts like coughing up blood and stuff. So I don't know if it's real because he doesn't do a lot. It's just a little bit like he spits and there's some blood. And he comes out later on, so I feel if he was bleeding internally, they wouldn't allow him to come back out. I mean, I know this was 20 years ago and things were a lot different with health and stuff like that, but I feel it was probably somewhat fake blood, but not exactly sure. Um, but Shamrock uh, ends up hitting a belly-to-belly -belly suplex onto Farouk, and he gets the win off of that. But then, immediately following the match, Farouk end up, ends up doing his move, the Dominator, on the Shamrock. And then from there, the whole Nation of Domination comes out, and they all start beating up on Ken Shamrock. And because of all that, that the Legion of Doom end up running out and clear the ring of the nation because they're all feuding currently at the moment so they come out to fight off the nation. The next up we have Stone Cold backstage and he's talking to commentary so JR and Jerry Lawler or whoever's on commentary probably Michael Cole in the first hour or something. They're questioning him about Owen Hart and he just makes a comment that Owen cannot intimidate him or injure him more than he already has because Obviously, this is after Owen Hart dropped him on his head in the pile driver, and so Stone Cold's out of action currently. And so he's, you know, saying that Owen doesn't affect him pretty much. Next up, we get a light heavyweight match of El Pantera, or the Panther, as they kept saying, versus Tonka Michinoku. So this is obviously like a high-flying luchador type match and stuff with you get the luchador of El Pantera and the Japanese style of Michinoku, which was also considered to be a high-flying, very similar to lucha style back in the day. So let's see. First off, some highlights are at the matchup. Pantera ends up doing, I don't know exactly what's called. I have it. I just wrote down as a handstand bounce, so where he's running towards the ring, and when he gets over to the ropes, he like bends down and does like a handstand and bounces off the ropes. Some people do this nowadays, but I, I don't know what the move's called exactly. But he does that, bounces off the side that the um, Tonka's on, on the floor, and then he, so he hits the handstand bounce, goes off to the other side and bounces off, and then runs back and does a plancha over the top rope onto Taka on the floor. And then from there, Taka ends up hitting Pantera with a spinning uh, heel kick in the ring, sending Pantera to the floor. And then Taka hits a springboard uh, crossbody, so obviously running, jumping up onto the top rope, and then jumping out, just doing a crossbody onto Pantera, which a crossbody is a, what Michinoku did a lot from my remembering of Taka a lot. And then Pantera goes on and he does the whole headstand on a turnbuckle, so kind of like what Jack Gallagher does nowadays sometimes so he does that but as uh, Taka comes running towards him he like you know falls down or whatever and does a hurricane rata sending Taka onto the floor and then from there Pantera does a suicide dive out of the ring right by the ring post onto Taka so he's kind of close to hitting the ring post in that maneuver and then Pantera ends up doing um back inside the mat ring doing a run up the turnbuckle so obviously he's getting like slingshot into turnbuckles but he ends up running up the turnbuckles and does a moonsault onto Taka Michinoku, but Taka ends up hitting a uh, top rope drop kick and then doing his talk or Michinoku driver and then gets the pin off of that. So he comes out the winner there. Next up, we have a Truth Commission interview backstage, and the commandant or whatever that they call him just um, says that they will show um, their strength against the LOD. So the power of, you know, the three different people that they have in the Truth Commission. And so that leads into our next match of Recon and Sniper of the Truth Commission going against the LOD. And so at one point during the match, Recon has Animal up against the ropes, you know, like hitting on him stuff. 
stuff. Well, the ref is distracted with Hawk at the time, and while that's going on, Interrogator just reaches up and grabs on the animal and just like by the belt or like belt area of his tights or whatever, the waist of his tights, and just like pulls him between the top and middle rope just out between the ropes and so it looked kind of funny um but so the interrogators obviously later became kurgan and stuff so he's you know a big seven foot guy and so he just like pulls animal out of the ring but the lod ends up hitting their doomsday device on recon but as they do that the interrogator gets into the ring and disrupts the pin and so lod ends up getting the win by disqualification since interrogator is not the person in the match and so while uh, the um truth commission is out there beating up on the LOD, Ken Shamrock ends up running out to help them since obviously they helped him earlier so now he's helping them that's why I'm saying I don't think his internal bleeding was really severe since he comes running back out now but you never know and because of that then the whole nation of domination ends up running out and attacking the um, Legion of Doom helping out with the Truth Commission so they all just uh, attack the LOD and Ken Shamrock next up we get one of my <laughs> I find these matches so entertaining but it's a mini match so we have El Torito which is not the Torito from a few years ago in WWE but I assume it's like a namesake type thing but it's a um, obviously a, a mini guy and he has a like bull mask on with horns and stuff but it's El Torito and Pierre I can never say his name right Priterita Morgan so Pirate Morgan and these two are both bigger minis so they're like a um, little bit taller and they're both like chunky guys and they're going against Max Mini which is the superstar or whatever you want to call it of the mini division he's like the guy they most focus on but he's like the world's smallest athlete and stuff and he's just so tiny and looks like a little kid but it's him and miss some guy named Mr. Lucky and they're about the same size and build and stuff but Mr. Lucky's uh, pretty decent with some of the maneuvers he's doing but because of this the match uh, starts off first by getting introduced by Sunny she introduced is then she usually does the cruiser or light heavyweight whatever you want to call it but since the minis have been around she's been doing those um so at the very beginning after she's doing the introduction uh, and max mini ends up coming out i believe last or something he's in the ring and he ends up like bending down to like try and look up her dress and she notices and like pulls her like dress down or whatever and gets out of the ring so i just thought it's funny that they're having little max being weird or whatever and trying to look up sunny's dress but to me as i said this is was a very entertaining match and it was pretty good um they had some decent high flying for the little minis because usually know with their size they can't get on the ropes properly and stuff and so there's usually a lot of botches but they were actually pretty good mostly coming from mr lucky um there's at one point they were doing just i forget who the two were i didn't write it down but they there was a lot of arm drag reversal so like they'd go for a move and i believe it was mr lucky again would then like grab onto a um arm turn it into an arm drag to reverse out of any of the moves that the other two would do to him but max mini ends up getting um the win with a flying uh headbutt onto el torito so he obviously it's a flying but headbutt and then gets the pin off of that and so like i said just very entertaining match like i know it's not proper for you know minis or whatever and stuff like that or however people feel about politically correct or whatever about the mini wrestlers but i just thought it was super entertaining and with all the different characters and stuff then we get a recap of the gold dust and brian pillman feud so again obviously brian pillman in control of marlena currently or terry whatever we'll call it gold dust's wife and so just a recap of that and then that goes into the match that we we're supposed to have from last week which was dude love versus brian pillman and obviously he comes out with marlena and he's dolled her all up and stuff which we'll get into and again this is for the intercontinental championship tournament match and so marlena when they come out she's dressed in all black so she has a like a like some sort of like tank top looking type shirt um that's like a midriff shirt or something so you can see her stomach she's wearing a little like skirt um, she has a nose piercing now and then I wrote that she looks kind of slutty or something but she, like her hair is all slicked back and stuff so she got like a bunch of hairspray or gel or some sort of stuff and it all looks slicked back but like in the, her outfit and stuff she's looking very slutty which is obviously what Brian Pillman's trying to get that you know she's kind of like his sex slave type thing. Um, at one point during the match uh, Marlena ends up like starts to leave so she just starts she turns and just starts walking up the ramp and Brian Pillman notices so he goes running up after her and brings her back to ringside which i thought he was gonna get you know like a count out or something and lose the match but he got back before the time and stuff and he takes her over to buy commentary and puts her over there um so in the match uh, brian pillman ends up throwing do love out of the ring and then pushes him into the ring step so obviously fighting on the outside getting into the more hardcore stuff as you can call it 
call it and stuff. I'm there at one point, dude, dude love. It's hard to say because I say dude and it just sounds weird. But dude love has uh, Brian Pillman in the corner and he's just bouncing his head off each of the turnbuckles. So like, you know, going from top to bottom, which I believe that happened in WCW too, if I'm thinking correctly. So we'll have to see when we get to that in a little bit. Um, but he's just bouncing it continuously off the each of the turnbuckles. So multiple times on each turnbuckle going down, obviously all three. And then from there, dude love goes to do the sweet shin music. So again, he crosses the ring and starts hitting his foot like Sean Michaels does going for the sweet shin music so he kicks him in the shin and then does what is Dean Ambrose's dirty deeds but just like a double underhook DDT but before he can do that Goldust runs out and ends up attacking Brian Pillman and Goldust was banned from the building because in the week before when Brian Pillman wasn't there he said you know he didn't want to be there because he doesn't feel safe with Goldust so I assume Slaughter or someone had Goldust banned from the arena and stuff for that so while he's in Goldust is in the ring doing that Marlene is just standing outside the ring smiling and cheering for Goldust you know beat him up and everything but because Goldust ran in Brian Pillman ended up getting the win by DQ. From there we go into hour two and it kicks off with Jerry Lawler doing an entering interview with Stone Cold and so this is kind of a popular segment. So to start off they do replays of the stunners that um, Stone Cold did on JR and Sergeant Slaughter from the week before and Stone Cold says that JR was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and that Sergeant Slaughter is you know not, not going to tell him what to do so he was showing him you know going against Slaughter and just doing whatever he wanted to do and then uh Vince <laughs> so Stone Cold obviously he calls Vince an arrogant ass and that he would stun Vince if he was here because Vince is gone for some reason I forget what if they sit I know they mentioned why he wasn't there but I don't remember exactly what it was and then of course going on he says that he will take out Owen at the snap of a finger and then right after that the Hart Foundation ends up walking out to the top of the ramp and Brett says you know that they're tired of Stone Cold attacking them with weapons all the time and that they have a lawyer there and so there's some other guy with them in a suit and stuff and so they send him down to the ring and he hands Stone Cold a piece of paper and you know Austin or, or Brett or Owen one of them says you know that you've been served with a temporary restraining order saying that he can't be within a hundred feet of the Heart Foundation. And so they do that and then they leave. And so Stone Cold standing in the ring reading it and JR is like looking over his shoulder reading, you know, what it says or whatever. And as he's doing that, Stone Cold just grabs his head and hits him with a stunner. So that's why I say it's kind of a big or important thing or whatever. Stone Cold continuing on his stunning spree of non-wrestlers. Because of Jerry Lawler getting stunned by Stone Cold and being taken out or whatever, Jim Cornette ends up ju uh, joining Jim Ross on commentary for the rest of the night and from there we go into a backstage segment of Jerry the King Lawler and it's him selling the stun by Austin and so he's got a neck brace on and it looks like the doctors or whatever are putting him on a backboard but yet it's like standing up so it's like against the wall and they're putting and so like they move him over against the wall and stuff so it's just kind of funny instead of it being on the floor but from there we go into our next match which is the Patriot versus Owen Hart and so as the match begins obviously they each come out with their respective flags a Patriot with US American flag and Owen Hart with the Canadian flag and they start the match by like threatening to like hit each other with the flag I'm pretty sure Owen starts it like you know holding it back like he's gonna swing it at Patriot and then Patriot does the same with Owen they just keep continuing to do that and as the match picks up there through the crowd starts a massive Owen sucks chance so that's just like you know spreading throughout the building it's super loud then at one point Stone Cold comes walking out to the top of the ramp and because of the whole restraining order thing police officers are following him and so he's just standing there for, for a few seconds and I believe it like cuts a commercial obviously goes back to the match and either way it then cuts back and Stone Cold's not there but the officers are still standing there and uh, so back into the match the Patriot ends up hitting the Patriot uh, missile onto Owen but Owen ends up kicking out and then from there Stone Cold comes running in through the crowd and he gets up on the apron and so by this he's distracting Owen and Patriots end up um, able to get the roll up off the pin uh, because of the distraction by Stone Cold. And then as um, after the Patriot won Stone Cold standing there, he holds up their strain and just rips it up and kind of just throws it or whatever. And Owen starts yelling for the cops to come down and arrest Austin. And as they start walking down the ramp, he runs off through the crowd so they don't get him arrested or whatever. And then it goes to a commercial and comes back and it shows the those officers are looking around backstage. So they're like opening doors and stuff looking for Stone Cold but they're not able to find him. And then that leads into Shawn Michaels coming out to the ring to be interviewed by Jim Ross. And so this is 
the segment that's kind of popular in Shawn Michaels history, like especially from that year, where he comes out wearing the real small black bicycle shorts or whatever type things you want to call them. And uh, this is where he has the big bulge in his pants, which Shawn's talked about it in, in like interviews and his DVDs and stuff recently, that it was a pair of socks that he had down his pants and he was just doing it again to try and just get a reaction out of people and to, you know, carry on with his antics that he's been doing. And so we get a replay first off um, of the attack on British Bulldog by him and Triple H the week before and Shawn Michaels says you know that he wants to win the European title so that way he will have won all the titles and be a Grand Slam champion in the WWE and so they're going to a pay-per-view I don't know when it is but it's like a one night only pay-per-view and it's in England and I know it's coming up soon but I don't know if it's like this the coming weekend at this point or if it's in a few weeks or something and so they start talking about um, the of course the Hell in a Cell match and so Sean's, you know, going again like that he's being screwed or whatever and stuff because he says, you know, by doing what he's supposed to do, he gets rewarded by being in a Hell in a Cell match. So again, by being the referee at back at SummerSlam and this starts the feud with Undertaker because he was just doing his job that he gets put in a Hell in a Cell and, you know, that's not fair and stuff. But he says, you know, that if he's going, he's going down, he's going to take everyone with him and he's going out in a blaze of glory. And after he says that, Undertaker comes up on the Titantron, like, and so interrupts and stuff. And so he's somewhere, I assume this was a pre film segment type thing, but it's just super dark and you just see the Undertaker and he's behind like a chain link fence. So like a part of the hell, uh, cell, like a wall or something. And he's just standing there talking and uh, he just mentions that he will be the only one to leave the cell and then of course that Shawn Michaels will rest in peace and all that sort of stuff. We then get into our main event for the night which is Bret Hart and British Bulldog versus the Headbangers and this is for the tag team titles and so the match overall was kind of a boring match I mean nothing really exciting went on throughout the match. Um, the Headbangers were in control most of the match so um, that could be why because you know with the good wrestlers or decent wrestlers or whatever Bret and Bulldog that they're letting the Headbangers be in control most of the match and stuff. Um, at one point, the uh, British Bulldog ends up power slamming Mosh, or doing his power slam, so his finisher onto Mosh, but Mosh isn't the legal man, and he gets the pin, but so after the ref counts to three, he notices that it's not Thrasher, who is the legal man, so he orders the match to continue. Um, at one point, British Bulldog, uh, like, Brett's in the ring fight, like, fighting with the, I don't know which headbanger could be both at this point, but, um, it goes over to Bulldog, and he's, like, fighting with one of the fans sitting, in, like, ringside over an American flag, like, he's, like, trying to pull it away from him, and he ends up getting a away from him, and then takes, like, the end of it, and just, like, smacks the fan with it, and so I'm not sure if you know British Bulldog was just being ass and like taking the flag away from it like he, it was like planted or something and the person that the fan wasn't giving it up or if while the Bulldog was over on that side the fan could have been you know like hitting or poking Bulldog with it and Bulldog you know got pissed I don't know because we didn't see anything beforehand but it's obviously one of those two things I would imagine so Bulldog has that American flag and so he gets in the ring and starts attacking Thrasher with it and so because of that the headbangers end up getting the win by disqualification and from there the Patriot and Vader come running out to help the headbangers and then while that's going on Vader ends up going up for the Vader bomb on Brett but Brett rolls out of the ring and that's how the show ends. And next up we go to Nitro and this is Nitro 105 again from September 15th 1997 and this took place in Charlotte North Carolina so kind of a big place of the four horsemen like one of their big like home areas or whatever and so the show opens up so this you know kind of starts out like slow or somber or sad or whatever you want to call it but it's just showing someone's head like they're in like a surgery room or something and they have like you know stitches and stuff all over their head well it turns out that is Ric Flair and so it's just like an up close of his head and like he's preparing for surgery or had surgery or just in the hospital or something but his head's all beaten and bruised and like I said he has stitches and everything and it turns out that the night before which was fall brawl and he was in the um war games match of him when the four horsemen against the nwo well his head got slammed in the door like he was laying on his back with his head like right outside the door and it was got the door slammed on it and it was by kurt henning so he did the turn on the four horsemen after a couple week or two ago whatever accepting 
Arn Anderson's spot in the Four Horsemen. He now turned on them, joining the NWO. And so that's the setup for the show. And it opens up on commentary and Tony Schiavone starts talking, but then he just like keeps talking like he's like choking up and holding back tears and stuff. And he says that he's not able, like he can't do the show. Like he has too much respect for Ric Flair and that Ric Flair, you know, started him in the business and stuff and that he can't do this with what's happened to Rick. And so Mike Tanay ends up taking over as the lead announcer throughout the show. Um, so we get a recap then of Fall Brawl. And so NW obviously won at Fall Brawl because Kurt Henning ended up turning on the Four Horsemen. And then they mentioned that last night after the events, Kevin Nash claimed that this was the death of the Four Horsemen. And so again, this is in horse... Uh, horsemen like home territory and stuff and so the crowd is obviously super hot for the four horsemen and then the nwo doing this the four horsemen you know sets up like the reactions from the crowd and stuff throughout the night we get into our first match tonight which is disco inverno versus dean malenko so at one point during the match dean ends up uh going for the texas cloverleaf but as he's get going for a disco pokes dean in the eyes and then commentators obviously mentions that jeff jarrett ended up beating dean at fall brawl so he needs this win you know to make stuff up or whatever or make up his win and so as the match continues they point out that Dean Malenko has an injured left leg I assume from the Jeff Jarrett or could have been before that match but he has an injured left leg so Disco starts trying to attack it to you know injure a body part on Dean Malenko to get an upper hand uh the crowd chants Disco sucks throughout the match continuously uh, so it shows you how much people like Disco Inferno but Dean is able to get a double underhook powerbomb off and then goes into the Texas Cloverleaf for the win against Disco. Our next match up is Ming and the Barbarian, or the Faces of Fear if you want to call them, versus Harlem Heat, who come out with Jacqueline. So as the match starts, they end up showing Raven sitting uh, ringside in the or in the crowd against the aisleway, as he's been doing. And so into the match, uh, Ming and Barbarian end up dominating most of the match, and Ming and Barbarian both go up for the double headbutt onto Stevie Ray, but they end up missing. And then Booker T gets tagged in finally by Stevie Ray, because obviously Ming and Barbarian have been double teaming on Stevie Ray most of the match so Booker T finally gets tagged in and cleans cleans like the ring out and stuff from both of them and hits both with spinning heel kicks to clear out the ring and then Booker ends up getting the pin on Barbarian but he's not the legal man Barbarian's not and so since it's you know Booker thinks they won or what or releases the pin at least whatever and he gets up and as he does Ming ended up coming in who is the legal man ends up grabbing the tongue and death grip onto Booker and then makes Booker pass out or whatever and gets the win off of that then we get our first Nitro Girl segment which are dancing on the ramp which then leads into a Mean Gene interview on the ramp with Diamond Dallas Page and so it's talking about how um, Diamond Dallas Page and Lex um, won their match against Scott Hall and Macho Man Randy Savage at Fall Brawl and then DDP says that he has a disease or that he's a sickness and everything and he has a disease and that disease is Randy Savage and that he's the only cure for him and so challenges Macho Man to a one on match at uh, Slim Jim Presents Halloween Havoc so Halloween Havoc from there we go into a match of Juventud Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr. so at one point in the match Juventud ends up missing a drop kick completely so it's a um, botch and stuff and like because Ray's like hanging on the top ropes so like you know it's like at his uh, midsection and he's just like hanging wobbling back and forth on it and Hoovadoo goes for a drop kicks but misses completely and so they just said oh they just missed him or something like that um but this match has a lot of great high flying especially you know with the two of them and Rey Mysterio is just amazing Hoovy goes um does a power bomb onto Ray off of the ring apron onto the floor so it just looks super nasty that was a nasty bump but Ray ends up coming through and hits the springboard Hurricane Rana for the pinfall on Hooventud. so Ray gets the win there continuing his rise next up we get a match of Steven Regal versus Alex Wright for the TV champ or championship which Alex Wright's the champ in this. Um, so between the two, both being Europeans and everything, there's a lot of technical holds and reversal going on here. But Alex Wright ends up getting the win with the German suplex. Um, so a lot of these matches I don't have a whole lot written for because you know a lot of there's not a whole lot of exciting, exciting stuff that goes on. But I just got what I can out of them. We then go to a Mean Gene interview on the ramp with Ray Trailer, and um, they first have a replay of the last week's attack where they you know end up NWO end up taking him out, spray painting Ray Who on his back. Um, and he vows that he will take out each one of the NWO members and that will take on each one of them and take them out. So like just trying to destroy them from the inside. From there we go into a match of Conan versus the Giant. So as the match starts Conan is attacking the Giant fast and like hard. So he just comes up just starts like hitting on beating him as much as he can. But the Giant's always over able to overpower them. Again real quick we go to another shot of Raven sitting in the crowd 
crowd, so building up and still showing why Raven is still sitting there. Um, at one point, Conan goes to jump off the top rope, and the um, the giant ends up catching him, and then like somehow quickly able to like get it, like he got him into the choke slam, and so choke slams him and gets the pin off of that. This leads into hour two, and we kick it off with the nitro girls dancing in ring and commentary starts discussing um you know again the heinous action of the nwo against the four horsemen at um fall brawl the night before so again continuing on keeping that story fresh in people's minds we then go into a stevie richards versus diamond allen page dallas page match um so in the match ddp ends up uh hitting a reverse tombstone and then like he does I call it a reverse tombstone, I don't know, like it's exactly like a tombstone, but um, Stevie's like, instead of falling down or straight down, whatever, he ends up just like falling forward with him, so I don't know exactly what the move is called or whatever, it just looked weird. But he does that and then um, picks up Steven Richards into a fireman's carry, and from there he just kind of swings him back and does the diamond cutter out of that. So it's almost uh, kind of like Brock Lesnar's move, but in reverse. So he has him up on his back and then swings his legs backwards and pulls him down with the diamond cutter. And since Stevie Richards lost the mass, Raven ends up coming into the ring and starts slapping Stevie in the face and then just kicks him a bunch of times, kicking him out of the ring and he leaves. We ne get our next match of Wrath and Mortis coming out with James Vandenberg against the Outsiders who come out with six. Um, so the match starts off with uh, Mortis and Hall and they pretty much stay even throughout the match. So you know, one person has upper hand than the other. Mortis ends up tagging in Wrath and Hall, it's like spits on him and then tags in Kevin Nash. So it's got the two big men going in the match now. Wrath ends up uh, tagging Mortis back in, like after, you know, a little bit of fighting, Wrath ends up tagging Mortis and so they start double teaming on Kevin Nash. Um, at, then at one point, Six ends up getting up on the apron, distracting the ref. And when he does that, uh, Mortis ends up, you know, hitting the rope. And when he does that, uh, Scott Hall hits him because he obviously bounced is in the corner that Scott Hall's standing in and so Scott Hall ends up hitting him and then allows uh, outsiders to get the upper hand and Cat uh, Kevin Nash ends up going up for or getting Mortis up for the power bomb and then getting the pin off of that by just putting his foot on Mortis's chest. Then we get Eric Bischoff coming out for an in promo in the ring. Um, he starts off by saying it's kind of like his classic line from WCW that it's good, uh, good to be king. But it's not like his famous segment where he's wearing the king crown and on the motorcycle and stuff. But he says it's good to be king. Then he calls out NWO to come out for a celebration. So all the NWO members come out. And then they end up calling. I can't remember if it interrupts or if they call him out. But Ric Flair's music starts playing. And Kurt Henning comes out and he's wearing Ric Flair's robes and stuff. So trying to like impersonate Ric Flair. And the crowd starts chanting, we want Flair. And so they're uh, just kind of making fun of the whole Flair situation with his injury and stuff like that. And uh, they're talking to Kurt Henning and he ends up taking the robe off and folding up and he gets down on his knees and hands it to Hulk Hogan as a gift and you know like a whatever peace thing for when joining the NWO. Uh, Macho Man ends up getting on the mic and he says that he accepts uh, DDP's challenge at Halloween Havoc and then it goes back to Hulk Hogan and he says you know that NWO was he was joined and here to put the old men or the fossils out to pat who can't wrestle anymore at the pasture which is funny because he's one of those people be out there they take out people like him and then he's here they do something weird um but they reference that piper can eat all the eat all that he wants down there or he's something that he can eat all he wants and eat all they're like eat all he wants where and then they all do like the crotch chopper motion to their crotch and stuff so so that he can eat that area and stuff which is kind of weird and inappropriate but it's the 20 years ago in the 90s so stuff was different back then but from there hogan ends up accepting um, roddy piper's match at halloween havoc and then as the segment's closing out hogan has flair's robe and he starts flossing like his butt he has it between his legs and starts fl like flossing it back and forth with his robe so really disrespecting flair and stuff at this point then like, coming back i believe from commercial some there's a like a package of the hogan and piper feud in wcw so showing parts of all their matches and uh promos against each other and stuff that have happened for the last year and stuff. Then we get a match of Ultimo Dragon or Ultimate Dragon, whatever you want to call him, versus Eddie Guerrero for the Cruiserweight Championship, which Eddie's the championship at this point, or the champ at this point. Um, so at the beginning, Eddie, it, well, to start off, Eddie beat Chris Jericho at Fall Brawl for the test, so Chris was the championship, but Eddie beat him and won the mat, uh, title. Uh, the match was, so this match between the two was decent, but it was kind of boring, like, especially considering the two men in the ring, because Ultimo Dragon's really good, and then Eddie, obviously, a lot of people 
people know how good he was. Um, but like I said, it was just kind of boring overall. At one point, Drag Ultimate Dragon ends up hitting the Liger Bomb, so m- move made famous, obviously, by, th- um, I forget it was, th- what, Thunder Liger or Liger? I can't remember what his name is. Whatever the Japanese wrestler is. And then, uh, at one point, Ultimate Dragon ends up going for the Dragon Sleeper, but he has an injured shoulder from probably, like, Fall Brawl match or a week before or whatever. Um, but as he's going for it, or because of his shoulder injury, Eddie's able to break out of the hold, and then um, Eddie hits the shoulder with, or hits a uh, dragon with a shoulder breaker, so injuring the shoulder even more, and then goes up and hits the frog splash for the win. Next up is the Nitro Girls dancing in the aisleway, which leads then into our main event for the night, which is Kurt Henning against Steve Mongo McMichaels, which is the U.S. champion, and I believe this is for the U.S. title, and so you can tell this is a big match or whatever, the main event or whatever, because Michael Buffer in up coming out and doing the introduction for the match and so um the match starts off real high obviously with mongo like immediately running up to the ring and just starting kurt henning just trying to get back or like get revenge for rick flair but uh kurt henning starts working over mongo's left leg again like people tend to do in the matches against mongo they just like to take one of his legs out because he's you know bigger guy so they bring him down the size type thing um and then as the match continues on after that mongo starts you know trying to do different moves like he picks him up i believe he has a uh, Kurt hitting up on his shoulder i don't know what he was going to do with it but he got him like up on his shoulder but his leg like you know has problems or everything he like falls down and stuff so Mongo's not able to really to do much but uh at one point Mongo ends up racking Kurt Henning into the ring post so I just like pulls his legs into the ring post racking him and then starts slamming his heads on the turnbuckles so, like I said in Raw he's has um hold of Kurt Henning's head and just slamming it off of each one of the turnbuckles but Kurt Henning um is able to end up catch uh to catch um steve mongo michaels with the fisherman suplex and gets the pin off that now i don't know if the match is for the title and i know steve mcmichaels is the champ but i don't know if this was a match for the championship or not so overall each um show wasn't too bad i again like usual enjoyed raw a lot more nitro seemed really short i mean it was still a two-hour nitro so we didn't have all the extra stuff. Even though I remember Mike Tanay ended up mentioning that, you know, we are approaching the 10 out, the 10 o'clock hour, but TNT is allowing us to go over. But like I said, it didn't seem that long. But that's going to be it for our review this week of the Monday Night Rewind podcast. Going back 20 years to the Monday Night Wars, we recovered Raw and Nitro from this week from September 15th, 1997. So if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a thumbs up for me. Leave any comments you have in the comment section below. And hit that red subscribe button to catch more episodes each weekend. And we will see you next time.